swallow winging on the wind is innocence in a boy. If you think that laughter lies in things, to things you'll be but a slave. Joy will come to anyone whose heart has learned to fly. Joy will come to anyone whose heart has learned to fly. And you'll never sing. You could win the world and still be poor with peace and live like a king. Sunday service, especially those visiting the Expanding Light uh, at the Meditation Retreat and those viewing online. I'm Naya Swami Krishnadas, and this is Naya Swami Mantra Devi. It's lovely to do this service with you, leading up to one of the most deep and inspiring times here at Ananda Village, which is Christmas. Our celebrations, our eight-hour meditations and then our Christmas service, which will be on Sunday this year. So, I'll be reading from Rays of the One Light. These are weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This week, living in the presence of God. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, we read of a king, capitalized for the reference is to God, who welcomes certain devotees to the divine consciousness, saying, I was and hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. The elect asked him when it was they had served him in these ways. And the king answered, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. To see God as residing in every human being, as indeed he does, is to open oneself to limitless opportunities for serving him. Paramahansa Yogananda, in Autobiography of a Yogi, described a saint who lived in this consciousness as the greatest man of humility 
I ever knew. He described a seemingly chance encounter with this saint. Another day found me walking alone near the Howrah Railroad Station. I stood for a moment by a temple, silently criticizing a small group of men with drum and cymbals who were violently reciting a chant. How undevotionally they used the Lord's divine name in mechanical repetition, I reflected. My gaze was astonished by the rapid approach of Master Mahasaya. Sir, how come you here? The saint, ignoring any question, answered my thought. Isn't it true, little sir, that the beloved's name sounds sweet from all lips, ignorant and wise? He passed his arm around me affectionately. I found myself carried on his magic carpet to the merciful presence, capitalized. If you would see God, watch for him everywhere. If you would hear his voice, listen for it in all sounds and also in their supporting silences. If you would know God, seek his wisdom behind merely human knowledge. The Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter states, One who beholds my presence everywhere and all things dwelling equally in me, he never loses loving sight of me, nor I of him through all eternity. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be here with you. And I'm going to begin by reading from Whispers from Eternity, Poems and Prayers by Paramahansa Yogananda. It's a prayer demand for self-realization. O cosmic vibration, reverberate through me as the cosmic intelligent sound. Teach me to find in thee the presence of the reflected Christ consciousness. O holy vibration, lead me to intuit the Christ in thee. O omnipresent cosmic sound of Om, reverberate through me and expand my consciousness from this body to the whole universe. Teach me to feel in thee the all-permeating perennial bliss of the Supreme Spirit. Very apt for today's reading. Um, Happy World Brotherhood's Day. This is a tradition that Swami Kriyananda started in the uh, early 80s. And it's the core of Master's teachings, really. It represents that. That it's the bringing together of all souls, all humanity and brotherhood. And also lifting the consciousness of all men and women. And um, I read something funny recently that made me, reminded me and made me think of what it was like when Master and Swami first started. There was a man driving down the freeway and his wife called him on the phone. And she said, Herman, be very careful. I just heard on the news that there's a car that's going the wrong way on Interstate 280. And Herman said, he said, oh no, there's not just one car, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> And, you know, it made me think what it was like for Master and Swami when they first started. When Master came to this country, and here he is going in the other direction of the material consciousness of this world. And one person joined him, Dr. Lewis, and soon a few, and then thousands came to his lectures. And the same with Swami Krenanda, when he first started Ananda and the World Brotherhood Colonies. 
He first, Jyotish, came, and then a few, and now thousands and thousands, and there will be millions, Master said. So it's really a blessing for us all that we can be part of this movement, and now we're part of that stream that, that has turning, and that is turning through this. But you've probably heard a lot about India lately because Jyotish and Devi coming back from their time in India and Atman telling us of his, him and Mark's adventures in India. And um, Krishna Das and I just came back uh, from leading a pilgrimage in India. We had 32 pilgrims, a wonderful group, just a wonderful group. Everyone was on this pilgrimage, had a connection with either Master or Babaji and the rest of our gurus too. And so it was, it was a real time of people taking a leap in spiritual growth because this is, as Davy said, you go on a trip like this and you come back a different person. And you do come back a different person. It's, it's a time when you can really focus on God and these uh, places that we're going that are steeped in a deep vibration. Now, one woman, she said, she said well, um, she had been dealing with a lifelong problem of feeling unworthy. And she said, Sri Yukteswar and Babaji took that away from her. And she said, Sri Yukteswar uh, operated on her mind and spine, and Babaji came and showed, gave her that love for everyone. And so this is... A real, it was such a blessing for so many people. And, but I want to say that the reason that pilgrimage is such a blessing and the reason that people come back changed and the reason that it's so powerful are two things. One, we go to holy places where saints have been and those holy vibrations are still there. As the scriptures say, one moment in the company of a saint is your raft over all of delusion. The other thing though is the focus. Because you can be in the, the presence of a saint and if you're self-involved and you're thinking about other things, you're not drawing from it what you could. And it's the same on pilgrimage. It's that focus and that prayer. People are praying very hard. People are um, praying because it's also not comfortable. We're traveling a lot. The, the air is bad. There's all kinds of things. And um, so people are putting extra energy into their spiritual thoughts. They're thinking. We're reminded all the time. We chant on the buses. We tell stories. We, you know, go to all these places. It's, it's very powerful. If you can go on pilgrimage, I would really encourage that. But I also want to say, as Jyotish said, pilgrimage is inner. And that's where the real pilgrimage is, is inside of ourselves. So we can go wherever we want, but it's always happening inside of ourselves, right? And so if you've spent that same amount of time here, focusing every day on God, meditating, praying, then you would take a leap, a huge leap in your spiritual life. So it doesn't really matter where you're at. What the, what the pilgrimage gives you is that opportunity to really focus for that length of time. But you don't need to do that. You don't need to go anywhere. We have right here, well, one place we went was Kasipur. And Kasipur is where Ramakrishna left his body. And you go in this complex, it's, it's uh, spacious grounds, and the moment you walk in, you feel this deep peace, very, very deep, I, I, just incredibly deep. You just want to go into this peace and not move and not leave ever. And um, I felt that peace in one other place, and that's the Mon Moksha Mandir, Swami's Moksha Mandir. It is, has that deep sense of peace, because that's what Swamiji was, was that, that I think that's what his instance was greatly, was that sense of peace. And so you go there and you can just sink into that. Ananda 
village is a great pilgrimage place. We have it right here. We have the Moksha Mandir, we have Lahiri Shrine, we have the meditation retreat, silent um, temple, temple of silence. And so it's like we don't have to go anywhere. We need to just dive deeper into what we have here. And coming here, people, you know, I've been to a lot of holy places in a lot of different countries. And I must say that these places uh, that I just said, these different temples and the Moksha Mandir is as deep as the deepest and deeper than most. So we're so blessed to have this here, what we can take advantage of right now. Um, Swamiji said that the fundamental, and Master said this too, of course, the fundamental problem of us on this plane is that the ego thinks that it's separate. And that's the basic misunderstanding that we have. And this is what Jesus was talking about in the reading, was what you do unto others, you do unto me, because we are all one together. And Ramakrishna was dying at the end of his life of throat cancer. And he had his disciples around him. And uh, he was, they knew that he was dying, he was going. And there was a pundit there. And he said, Master, if you turn your concentration onto your throat, you can remove the illness. It says in the scriptures that yogis can cure themselves this way. And Ramakrishna said, Oh, but how can I take my mind away from the lotus feet of God and turn it to this worthless cage of flesh and bones? And one of the disciples said, well, for our sake at least. And um, Ramakrishna said, well, do you think I enjoy this suffering? Do you think I want to go through this? No, I wish to get well, but um, it's up to the mother. And one of them said, well, please pray to Divine Mother, she'll listen to you. And he said, well, I can't pray for my body. And they said, for our sake, for our sake. They didn't want him to leave. And so a few hours later, he said to Narendra, one of his disciples, he said, well, I said, Mother, I can't swallow food because of my throat. So there's such pain in it. Would you make it possible for me to eat? And she said, pointing to all of you, he pointed to all the disciples, he said, you are eating quite enough through all these mouths, isn't it so? And he said, and then I was ashamed and couldn't utter another word. Because he was so above that. And, you know, it, it's like realizing that oneness, and also he was utterly receptive and... Um, whatever Divine Mother wanted for him. And Swamiji, Swami Kriyananda, one time he was visiting us in Santa Monica when we were starting Ananda there in a center, and he had a stomach ache, an upset stomach. And there's this little yogic thing, you know, where you, you rub your tummy and put your finger around that will help with digestion. And I suggested that to him, you know, I just kind of like, you know, trying to be helpful. And he said, um, he said, I said, you could do that. And he said, yes, I could do that. But he didn't. <laughs> and I noticed, I noticed that he didn't do that. He wasn't like, it was, he didn't like self-help his body. I mean, people would give him remedies, people would give him things to help his pain and other things, and he would take them when given by someone else. But he was very conscious of his oneness and his receptivity to what God wanted for him, and not overriding his karma through his own self-will, which is what we often do. And um, he said in, I was reading Narayani's book, that just came out. It's a wonderful book. You should read it. It really it made me feel very close to Swamiji and there's all kinds of kernels of wisdom in there. And one thing, she was admiring his generosity and he said, generosity is one person giving to another. He said, I don't see it that way. I see everyone as an extension of myself and um, that everyone is a part of me. 
And so as we, and later, he had such compassion for people. And uh, some people came with a long-standing hurt. And he had such compassion for them when he talked to them and just took their hands and, and they started crying and he started crying. And he would just became more and more. At one point he said, I don't know where Kriyananda leaves off and Yogananda begins. And so see, this is where we're, we're trying to get into more into that, that, okay, it's not just our reality, but increasing our awareness of everyone as being part of us. And as we get more, and this is world brotherhood, this is, this is raising the consciousness, and it is happening in this world today. But in India, there's a, there's a different sense. You know, they have a different sense of space. They have a different sense of, of um, their individuality. It's not, somehow the veil is thinner there between spirit and the physical. And one thing, um, and in America, we're so into our space. You know, it's even become a say, saying, I need my space, you know. I need, I need my little place, I need this. And, and in India, like visualize this along the Ganges River, there's, there's a wonderful walkway that they're building up higher so people can walk back and forth and along the river and then down lower. There's people in the, uh, near the bank and they're washing clothes and taking baths and there's a little burning god down the, the way and all this is happening, you know, just, just harmoniously people, there's lots of orange clawed swamis and they're maybe sitting, they're maybe uh, walking, um, people talking. And um, one of the adventures on the pilgrimage is a river rafting trip. And so at the end of the trip, the, the boat's coming in towards shore and um, here on the shore is a woman with a big pile of laundry and she's doing her laundry. There's several youths and they're, they're scrubbing up and soaping up and, you know, putting water over their heads and the burning god is, is um, you know, billowing smoke from a body a ways down. And here comes this boat that's full of these helmeted and um, westerners and with their life jackets on and it comes right up and almost bumps right into this woman's laundry. And she just looks up and smiles, you know, at all these odd looking people and, and, um, and moves over a little bit, you know? There's no thought of, this is my space, hey, what are you doing? That kind of thing. It's, it's that, okay, it's all harmonious. I mean, if that was America, we'd have it all partitioned off and there'd be boys and, and cords and you do washing here and you have your bath over here and we have a up to code pier so that the, the uh, um, boat can dock, you know, it would be signs all over. And instead, it's just this harmony. There's no sense that, okay, you, what you're doing is better than what I'm doing or has more importance. And, and it, it, that's the beauty of India. That's one of the beautiful uh, parts of it. And there, there are many uh, stories of saints and trains and that we've run across. I mean, there's a story of Lahiri's disciple. She really wanted to see Lahiri. And she got to the train station late because of traffic. And so she prayed, Lahiri, please stop the train. And, and um, someone came up and, and when the official and said, can I go buy you tickets? And that was very unusual. And as soon as she was settled on the train, uh, the train started to go and everyone had to scramble on because they couldn't figure out why it had stopped and why it started. And Neem Karoli Baba, another saint, was when he was young, and they say that by the time he was 17, he knew everything. He was, knew everything about everyone. And so he was a great saint. And we, we go to his ashram and meditate there. And it's very wonderful. And, um, and he's also a saint that he doesn't stick to the rules kind of thing, you know. He's not, not a real serious kind of guy. But he 
uh, was thrown off the train when he was young because that was the beginning of when they weren't letting sadhus be on the train without tickets. And so he got off the train and um, then the train wouldn't go. And it took them a while to figure out what was going on. And at that point, they had to persuade him to get back on the train. And he got back on the train and then the train went. And so we, this time in the pilgrimage, we have our own little train story. And so I thought I'd tell it to you. It's not quite so dramatic. But nevertheless, I mean, one thing about trains is they are dependable. That's the one organized thing in India, as trains are dependable, they, they leave and they arrive on time, basically, usually. And um, we, um, w everyone was tired. We had just been to Kolkata. We had been um, to Master's home, very inspiring. Three people took discipleship there. And um, we, but people were tired. We just arrived back in Delhi. It was the worst air day in all of history. And it was, in fact, Jyotish and Devi almost couldn't leave on time because they, the, the air was so bad and the plane wasn't landing. And so we get back, and the other thing is that the, the farmers are all burning their crops. That's what makes it so bad everywhere. And um, they don't have the money or the equipment to, to turn under their crops for the next year, so they burn them all. And here's one little farmer who thinks, well, just my little farm, that's not much, but you have tens of thousands, that's a lot. And so the air is really thick. And people are tired, some people are not feeling that well. And we had got in in the evening and we were leaving on the 6.30 train the next morning, which meant we had to get up and be there at 4. And so we uh, get on the train and we're trying to figure out what to do, um, the three of us. Uh, and because here it is, we looked ahead and looked like Hardwar and Rishikesh the air was really bad there too. And our plan was to arrive at 11.30 and go to Keshavananda's ashram where some of Lahiri's ashrams are, or ashes are, and then walk down the Ganges and walk over on a bridge, go for lunch, and come back and go to Ma's ashram, Anandamoy Ma's ashram. And we're just thinking, we can't be outside this whole time. Keshavananda's ashram is outside, the Mandir's outside, and we, we just can't. Um, and so we better just, in the end, we thought, okay, we'll just go to lunch and go to uh, Rishikesh. And people were disappointed, of course, because people, everyone wanted to go to Ma's ashram. And so at one point I just said, oh, Ma's in charge. She'll, she has to arrange it. And then, and I said, and, Let's pray to Shiva to blow a mighty wind down the Ganga and blow all the smoke out of the, out of the way. And um, so we're going along and we're all in the same car, most of us in the uh, train. And so we're noticing that the train's going really slow. And it's going slow and there's kind of fog and smoke outside. And, but it is going pretty slow. And then we get word that the train's going to be an hour and a half late. So here we are, an hour and a half longer on the train. And then when we get out, we go, um, we will start walking along the Ganges. And the air was actually quite fine. It was, it was really nice. We walked along, went over the bridge, went to the restaurant. And when we were done at the restaurant, it was the exact right time to go to Ma's ashram. So, because it didn't open at four, and with, otherwise we couldn't have done it. So, you know, take it as coincidence, take it whatever you want, but you know, Ma's in charge, she made the train slow down, and we were able to go to Ma's ashram. So, um, when, we, when we pray to Divine Mother, she really helps us, and you know, Divine Mother comes in many, many forms. It, um, and, and I just had a kind of a, you know, I was thinking about Divine Mother and her trillions of children. And on this pilgrimage, we have our different roles, and I tend to be the one who takes care of people, and if people have sore throats, and 
and you know things and there's always somebody coming there's I felt like a mother with 30 children and I said that one time you know some of them are older than me but it was like I felt like you know each one was so beautiful each person had their own beautiful attributes each person was praying their hardest each person was putting their all into it everybody was sharing with each other and and if somebody needed something somebody else had it for them it was just a real beautiful harmonious energy the whole thing and I was thinking you know Divine Mother has trillions and trillions of children and she pays attention to each one's needs every single person is when we pray to her and if you were a mother with several children and you would know that each one is beloved to you each one is different but which one would you probably feel the closest to the one that gives you your you their heart right those that open up their heart to you and that's Divine Mother when we open our heart to her she's going to help us in whatever ways that we need and really give to us in in that way but we have to earn it and this is what Master said when a devotee asked him said Master give me the grace of devotion and Master said you're saying give me money to buy what I want but I'm saying you need to earn it and then I will give you money to buy whatever you want and so we need to earn that how do we earn it in in what what is it what is our goal the fundamental delusion of mankind is that we're separate that's what Swami said that's what Master said is that we're separate and so how do we develop that as Jesus was saying that as you do unto others you become one because when we think of ourselves, it separates us that's what the ego is all about defining and redefining and when we think of ourselves, we feel separate yes when we think of others it unites us and that's what our goal is and so how do we do that we know all the ways compassion for other people of never judging always thinking of what I can do not what I can get meditation we have the most wonderful Kriya techniques that will take us deep service all those things that that we know because all you have to do is read the scriptures but then it's doing it and it's ever more doing it and that's why when we go on pilgrimage whether it's an inner pilgrimage it's an outer pilgrimage all that it's doing is reminding us that's where we need to go that's the direction and as we keep practicing and keep praying and keep keeping our hearts open it's like God can lift us up and God will lift us up the more we do that until in the end as Swamiji said he didn't know where Kriyananda ended and Yogananda began and that's where we'll be in the light thank you what?